Today on Lockdown Red Wings, defense decides the game in Carolina. Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I'm a podcast producer for the Daily J, a WWJ News Radio podcast. Did the Daily J on Thursday. It was impromptu. To attack. I talked to Jack Golke, Trey Townsend, and Greg Campy uh, as their season availability yeah. ended to kind of just reminisce about the win over Kentucky and talk about what's next for the program and those players. So give that a listen on the sure. Odyssey app or app podcasts, uh, the Daily J. Scotty's the host over at Locked On Tigers. He had a fun one today. The Tigers won the season opener against the Chicago undefeated. White Sox in Chicago. Undefeated. Won 62-0 coming up. Uh, and uh, he's also a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. So go give him a listen over at Locked On Tigers and read his stuff. Help him stay employed. Word. Um, Scotty, got a question for you. Before we get into anything, I got a question for you. I want you to tell me which way you think I'm going to go in this episode. <laughs> Apathy or anger? Which, which? Because I, I'm in between. I don't know which way I'm going to go. Are you're not asking me to choose? You're asking me to like predict? Predict? Yeah. Because I don't know. Um, I feel like it's we're just like due for an anger one. I feel like it's been it's been a little while. Uh, we've been a little a little kind and 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 kind probably isn't like the right word. I mean, it's been a rough stretch. Obviously, the entire we've month been tired. Part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's been a it's been an exhaustion more than anything else. I think we're probably due for a uh, for an anger at some point, but we'll we'll see how it plays out. Mm, no, we'll see how it plays out. We'll see. Red Wings, uh, big stinker on the ice, four nothing in Carolina, just absolute turd, right, right. in the center, right right on the center dot. And uh, I mean, Carolina is what. Carolina is uh, it, offensively. That was pretty much what I expected to happen, but defensively. Well, let's get to a difference maker, Scotty, because before I, before I spoil it, Scott, I, I, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you oh, say, you I'm going to let so you have much. the honors of yeah. uh, throwing this player under the bus. Thank so, you so much. You're, that you're really welcome. Means, you're just, welcome. Yeah, really. I'm, is I'm awesome. already getting angry. I can already feel it. <laughs> um, I'm going to take, Carolina team defense. Oh, just shut to up! Set you up even more. <laughs> really make my prediction come true here. Uh, but I'm going to take Carolina's defense being the uh, the difference maker in this one. And that's just again, you had mentioned the Red Wings team. I guess you could just do both team defenses. The Red Wings team defense was not exactly awesome either, especially after the first period. But uh, the you're okay. You're next. It's okay. Um, the um, the Wings had, what was it, 12 shots on net after the second period? Uh, like, I mean, it was it was remarkable. Uh, they had single digit. I think they had nine or something throughout the majority of the first. It was really a, a Carolina Hurricanes hockey game for sure. And you could feel it and you could tell while watching it. And they never really got great opportunities. And even when they did, uh, they did not execute. They had one breakaway in the first period that just didn't get finished. Yeah, not not awesome. And just missed the net entirely. I never saw a replay on that. I don't know if it went off Anderson's stick or not, uh, conference breakaway opportunity. But yeah, I mean, yeah. that's that was the obvious one. I was trying to give you the one that, and I know what you did. You did that on purpose, you, <laughs> you, you, you little... You little stinker you uh but yeah the carolina team defense was exactly what i expected i mean in every facet of the game they just dominate they're such an aggressive team in the neutral zone that red wings get finally break free and in the defensive zone they get it into the neutral zone and they're immediately on you red wings turn the puck over they can't they can't break through when there's that kind of pressure and so again then they're forced if they want to get into the offensive zone, we've talked about this before, to dump and chase, which is like the worst possible thing you can do against a team like Carolina because they do the thing that Derek Lalone, and I have thoughts on Derek Lalone in this episode, um, they do the thing that Derek Lalone wants the Red Wings to do, which is play complete team defense. But they play complete team defense 
because they attack it the right way. And that is by attacking the Red Wings sit back and try to just stay in lanes and, you know, predict where passes are going to go. Carolina will attack you. They'll attack you in the neutral zone. They'll attack the puck carrier. They're not going to sit back and try and just pick up a passing lane. The body positioning that this team has is elite. Like getting along the boards in a 50-50 puck battle, they always turn their body in the perfect way to keep it away from the uh, 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 defending or the opposing four checker. And in the puck battles, Red Wings didn't win a single one. Didn't win a single one. 50-50 battles, didn't win a single one. Carolina's team defense is, I mean, it's the reason why they have the best Corsi 4 percentage, best Fenwick, and the second best expected goals percentage, right? They just shut everything down. And then on the other end of the ice in the offensive zone, they didn't give a crap about quantity or quality. Yeah. They just throw, they <clears throat> sling that thing at the net. You look at the heat map in this game, Scotty, it's the entire defensive zone for the Detroit Red Wings. They took shots from anywhere they could get them. And this leads into the difference maker for the Detroit Red Wings. Eventually, it broke through because somebody would eventually make a defensive lapse. And then that person would make another defensive lapse and then take a penalty, which would lead to a penalty, a power play goal, and then a softy against. But obviously my difference maker in this hockey game goes to none other than NHL veteran and son of Detroit Tigers pitcher, Dan Petrie, Jeff Petrie. What a game by Jeff Petrie in this game. I, Bro, I, I hate, 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 hate reading comments in game after after a recap and seeing people put a loss on all of one player because having played the game not at a high level I suck at ice hockey but having played the game my entire life I understand it's a team sport and yeah there are definitely games where one player can have a multitude of a mistake snowball but you understand any given game that it's a team sport and it can go anywhere but I I don't I don't I can't make that excuse in this game Jeff Petrie made back to back to back errors that put them down one nothing, two nothing, three nothing in the second period. The first one, the Carolina Hurricanes are coming across the blue line. It's a they have two forwards coming across the blue line on Moritz Sider's side. Michael Rasmussen's already picked up the second body as Sider's attacking the puck carrier. Jeff Petrie decides to slide over, abandoning the passing lane and abandoning the net front to leave Sebastian Ajo open back door. Rasmussen sees it and goes, what the hell, and tries to get over. But at that point, it's too late. The cross seam pass is already so easy for an NHL 14-style cross seam goal. Like, it is it is ridiculous. So OP, how by the way. Is. It is OP, which is why in the NHL, you would think they would cover it. <laughs> and then seconds later, the Bally feed goes out. But according to my Twitter feed, Petrie takes a tripping penalty leading to a penalty kill. And then they Seth Jarvis immediately scores, gets into the slot, takes a shot, beats Reimer clean. And then minutes later, Jeff Petrie, not at all aware that who, who even was it at that point was standing right behind him. And then Another cross seam goal. He, he had no idea that guy was there. Easy peasy. It's like Petrie, for the love of God, what are you doing, dude? Head on a swivel. That is the first thing they teach you as a defenseman in the defensive zone. Head on a swivel. Don't just watch the puck carrier. Your job is to look for any spot that puck could also go to, any other target on the ice for a pass. And nope, just eyes on the puck carrier. I'm going to attack the puck carrier, even though Moritz Setter already has that guy covered. It's anger, by the way. Nailed it. <laughs> it was Natchez backdoor, by the way, who scored that third goal. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, that's the d defense on both sides is the difference maker. And I, I hate, I really don't like piling on to one particular player because it feels unfair because of what I, I <clears throat> said before I went on the, the tirade, right? Like, it's a team game. Mis like, mistakes pile on that lead to goals. But in this instance... Petrie just plays his position or keeps his head on a swivel. Those goals don't happen. And I've defended Petrie to a certain extent. I've also given him a lot of crap, but this is the first game where it's going to be unacceptable to me. If he plays the next one, if you're willing to scratch Jake Wallman after one bad game, multiple times a season, 
Same with Shane Gosses Bear. You got to do the same to Jeff Petrie. And I know, Scotty, that you're short on the right side. Like, I know you don't have, like, options on the right side. It's Wallman. I'm sorry. It's Cider. It's Petrie. It's Justin Hole. Those are your three options. The rest of your defensemen are left-sided. I know Sherratt and Gosses Bear can play right, but they're not as good on that side. But at this point, it's just unacceptable. I don't care if you have to play Justin Hall and Simon Edmondson together for one game just to send a message to Jeff Petrie. That was an unacceptable performance. And then the fact that I look at the box score at the end of the game and see none other than Jeffrey Petrie, I don't even know if it's Jeffrey, I'm just assuming, is leading the team in ice time at 1846 or whatever, and most Cider finishes the game with 1815. I understand you had 70 in this game. But the fact that Cider, with how good, and we'll talk about this in segment two, if I ever let Scotty talk about uh, talk again. In segment two, like, Cider and Shrott had a freaking great game, but yet they had less ice time than Jeff Petrie, who was a turnstile. I, I just, at a certain point, like, it's not just Petrie's fault. And I mean that as in, like, a certain point, it's coaching's fault for not seeing these errors, these unforced errors, and then not addressing it by sitting him in a game where you had an extra defenseman. Yes. Anything left to add? You know what? I think you covered a lot of it, brother. Okay. I think you did. We'll be back in segment two. We'll talk about notable performances. Um, I teased one just now. I got a couple other on the sheet. And we'll see if I can contain the frustration from here on out. But anyway, stay tuned to segment two of Lockdown Red Wings. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. Segment two, Locked On Red Wings podcast. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I s- <laughs> See, still not used to it yet. A little bit of extra responsibility. Still adjustment period. <laughs> um, Scotty, notable performers. Who uh, jumps to your mind, man? <laughs> um, on the Red Wings? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, uh, on the Red Wings. You're right. Yeah, I was going to... There's a few on the Canes we could talk about. Geez, some some yeah, good, good performances over on uh, on that side of the ice. I don't. I, I mean, I think we should. Uh, we always talk about goaltending. We can have a conversation about that. I don't know, good or bad. Certainly not great. Uh, I don't think it was like the worst goaltending performance I've ever seen. There was a couple of softies for sure. Uh, the one weird one off like the pad that did, then somehow redirected itself and went in was obviously not great and uh, yeah his stats at the end of this game are not going to be good rhymers but um i don't know we have a conversation about goaltending every time didn't do him any favors but uh, again rough defense and tough to do anything when you get shut out right like i Did have two shutouts in the last three games by the way or four yeah, well nothing shut out against the predators so yeah they're by the way their goal differential that was once one of the best in the league is down to plus one so yeah, we might end negative because of one month. And hey, ne- teams that finish negative typically don't make the playoffs. So, I mean, it'd be in line. Uh, but anyways, I mean, James Reimer, right? That's who we're talking about. He, I I was going to come on here and say, yeah, he had a really good game. Like I, the first three goals against, I don't put on him. I mean, I just went on a tie ride in segment one about who I'm putting the blame on, right? Yeah, yeah. He couldn't do anything about those two cross seam passes and the power play goal against it was in a high danger area right between the right between the hash marks. I mean, there's not much you can do on that. But then 
he let in his patented, patented softy, and that was patented the. Softy. And I mean, you could argue the second goal against was really when the game ended because you're not going to score a lot of goals against the Carolina Hurricanes. But the fourth goal for sure was one that's a backbreaker. Your goalie lets in a softy like that, it, it's over. And uh, at third period, to his credit, I mean, granted, the Hurricanes definitely took their foot off the pedal in the third. He came back around. I mean, it was a fine game overall, but that one goal, he just has got to, he's just got to rein in the softies. The, 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 Every single game, we talked about the same thing with Huso at the start of the season. But I mean, all this does is earn it's, Alex Lyon, I guess, more starts going forward because his it, run, his run of luck in these games has <clears throat> finally ended. Yeah, man, it's it's death taxes and a rhyme or softy every game. And it's like I I'm, I want him to succeed. Like he had a really good first and second. I was looking forward to coming on here and saying James Reimer looked sharp, but he just then he let in the softy, and you're like, all right, well. There goes that. Um, you know something I was also thinking about. What's that? While, while I was uh, while I was listening to you talk about James Reimer, you know it is possible. Look, here I am. You know, emotionally hedging. It maybe Cider didn't play that many minutes because of the fact that he was sick. I mean, we know Patrick Kane and Austin Zarnick didn't play today because they were sick. Jeff Petrie recently had it himself. Michael Rasmussen before that. Larkin had it. Woolman had it. Everyone in the locker rooms had it. So maybe Sider's playing a little bit under the weather, and that would explain his limited. I mean, he had three minutes of five on five ice time in the second after being a dominant force in the first period. And like, that's a notable performer for me, too, right? And I teased it in segment one. Sherratt and Sider played fantastic. And I, the first period, I was ready to come on here and talk about how this was the best game that pair had played all, like, I was going to say all season, but in this stretch where they've had to play together, they looked dominating. But then segment two rolls around and he plays three minutes of five on five and five minutes total. And then by the end of the game, he's only played 1842, 1756, or I'm sorry, 18, 1815 total and 1535 at even strength. And again, I understand that you have seven men, so it's going to be a little bit trimmed back, but he played 24 minutes the night before. Like, he's very capable of playing big minutes. And he's your best defenseman. And he and Sherratt are your only capable pair right now. Which, so why are you playing them less than, unless you're just trying to expose Simon Edvinson? But you're, it, are, is he really gaining anything by putting on a pair like this? I don't. This is not, that that cannot possibly be it. If that is the reasoning, I'm, I, I, I would lose it. You, you're not, but, you're not. You're trying to win hockey games. You're not trying to expose your youth when you're a point out of the a point out of the, the wild card. Like but I'm grasping at straws. Like I yeah, know no, that, I, but I'm, I'm literally I'm trying to make sense wild. of what Derek Lalonde is doing. And I guess hell. I mean, unless you you want to add anything about Sherratt and Mo real quick before I talk about Derek Lalonde. Not really. I mean, yeah, like they they've consistently been the the best pair. And I, I don't think that that has really changed this entire time that Wallman's been out and uh, we've had entire episodes dedicated to cider specifically his deployment. And it's to quote DeMarcus cousins. It's getting ridiculous. It is. And I mean, that's why the heat on Derek alone is, is, is cranked up after this game for me. Like we talked about it a couple weeks ago, like it, the burners on, but I believe in continuity behind the bench. Yeah, you know, yeah. you don't want to go through too many coaches too long. You want to give them a little bit more time to figure it out. The team played good in the past. They're just going through a rough patch, you know, and that is on him, but like, give it some time. I'm running out of patience really fast, really, really fast because the, the, the usage more cider received early on in the season was cute. It was cute. It's like, aha, look at Moritz Sider and Jake Wellman, toughest deployments in the league. That's something we can write home about while we defend that, you know, he's his numbers don't look great, which is, again, the reason why his numbers don't look great. But now it's no longer cute. Now it's a cry for help. Like, why is Moritz Sider only being saddled with these ridiculously tough minutes against tough opponents in the defensive zone. When you look at any other top pair D in the league or number one defenseman in the league, and it's evened out by minutes against good, you know, lesser opponents, you know, you're playing shifts against the second or the third or the fourth line of the other team in the offensive zone to generate some offense, which he's very capable of doing. We know that, 
but that's not happening. And instead, in this game, when he and Chirac go out there and have a dominant first period where they play nearly eight minutes of ice time, he gets rewarded by playing just five in the second period. And if this is a conditioning thing, well, I'm sorry, that's also the fault of the staff. If, if you don't have this player in the prime of his life, he's 22 <laughs> years old. You're like, you're literally never going to be in better. I refuse you can to get believe stronger. I refuse right, right. to believe. But like, this is me again, like running through the processes, trying to make yeah. sense of it. If it's a conditioning thing that he can't play big minutes, that's on the team. If it's maybe if he's sick, that would explain it. But then why did he play eight minutes in the first period? Like he was great in the first. He's been great. He was great the entire game. So was Sherratt. Sherratt's been great ever since bumping up there. But instead, you play Jeff Petrie, who made three critical mistakes in this game, and give him the most ice time when you'll bench any other defenseman not named Moritz Sider for making mistakes that at just as simple. I, I don't. I like this is on Derek alone at this point, and that's why it's cranked up. This is like not acceptable usage of your burgeoning star. This is coming at the cost of the development of this team. And while we're talking about it, the system that I've been defending, the system that did result them in two straight months of success has just, it's, it's not working whatsoever. And it, the, the creativity is stifled. And before I hear anyone say, well, they didn't have Patrick Kane in this game. They didn't have Patrick Kane for October or November either. And they dominated those months. So I don't know who is at fault for the consistency, but at a certain point, it has got to fall on the head coach. And I know it's only, we're not even through year two with Derek Lalone yet, but this team's inability to figure it the F out in the most important stretch of the season is, is wearing thin with me. It is. Yeah, no, that is, I, I think, inexcusable. And we've talked about that a lot, right? The, I think that point at the end is really the, the best point of that uh, entire spiel <laughs> i was trying to think of a better word than spiel but like i i think that that point at the end was was really the best part right this is the most critical time in the season and they cannot figure out anything like that genuinely they cannot figure out anything on offense as we said that's that's two shutouts in your last three games the offense has completely gone stagnant there has been no creativity on the offensive side of the ice for the entire month of March, right? Obviously the losing streak started off the month, but uh, this is, we talked about it a lot for a while there. It was pretty much just Lucas Raymond and, and pray, right? Like it was just yeah. like, hope that Raymond can do enough for, you know, a while. And, uh, and that obviously is not a sustainable way for any hockey team to operate. So yeah, man, it, I, I, I think again, that point at the end is the best. It's, you you have no ability to find your your ground and find your footing and figure it out, and it is the most critical time in the season, and that's just inexcusable on all accounts. And I understand that when the team was successful in March, January, and February, that that was unsustainable. I knew they were not that good. Yeah, of course. But they're also not this bad, and yet they can't find a way to shake themselves of this funk. And if at a certain point. This it falls on the head coach. Like it's the coaching staff's job to get your team out of the funk, get their heads back into the space, get them to commit to your system. And that's just not happening. It's just not happening. So, all right. Segment three, we'll look at the standings because silver lining. I, I'm not even going to say it. Not, I'm not even going to say it. Other games happened and the Red Wings couldn't capitalize on that. So, segment three of Lockdown Red Wings. Segment three of Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Scotty, uh, do you have anything else to add about this game in particular? No, I mean, I, I was going to mention uh, Kane and, and Zarnik obviously not playing, but you alluded to that in segment two. That obviously didn't help anything. <laughs> um, I think that, <clears throat> Larkin since coming back is, is not like, how do I word this? You can tell he's not 100% Dylan Larkin. Does that make sense? I think that that's a, uh, a fair assessment. Um, I mean, we knew he wasn't going to save the season regardless. He was going to help. 
But he like him no, single handedly coming back. But, gonna yeah, stay it's just like he's pretty clearly playing hurt. Is all I'm saying. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Um, you want to talk about uh, David Perron and how yeah, he was the, fired up. He was fired up, but also like he got that really just egregious hooking call at the start of the game. Yeah, like egregious. Like I watched the replay, and I'm still trying to find out where the hook is. Yeah. Um, but I think there's a little bit of a reputation against him because he does draw a lot of hooking and holding penalties because he's always a step behind. He's been a horrible skater his whole life. But he and Rasmussen seem to take and this is the wrong game to talk about it, actually, because that penalty he took honestly was a bad call. But he and Rasmussen do routinely take really bad penalties at least once per game. Just this time it was not egregious. It was it was egregiously bad call, not right, egregiously yeah. No, Dumb fair penalty. enough. Yeah, he was hot this game, man. He he oh, was he, really because of that. Yeah, <laughs> it it didn't go away either. He, <laughs> um, yeah, that that lasted. He didn't need the salts in this one. He was he was he was fired up all three periods. Um, I, I don't know. I think that's pretty much it, man. Like there again, you weren't able to do anything in the offensive zone. Um, and now we've talked about the the defensive uh, deployment and whatnot, which was kind of our biggest point. So. Yeah, and so, I mean, with that, I mean, we can talk about other games around the league, right? The, uh, you know, normally I would come on here and I would say, well, they didn't lose any ground because the Capitals lost to the Leafs and the Flyers lost, too, to the Montreal Canadiens. But I'm, I, can't, I can't in good faith come on here and say that because how many times are you going to lose games in days where the team you're chasing also loses and then sure. not gain any ground? At a certain point, you have it's not a win. If, like that, yeah. Like a that's, that's that's not a that's not a celebratory thing. That's you didn't take advantage of a situation that that you could have. Uh, and at that's some happened, point, it stops being a good thing. And that, that's where we're at. Like this has happened three or four times in this bad stretch, where as the team has been skidding, they've had an opportunity to make up ground. If they had won games on two days, two days, in which. Either of these teams lost, Capitals, Islanders, Flyers, whatever you want to say, they'd still be in a wild card spot. But throughout this stretch, they have continuously failed to capitalize on the teams they're chasing losses. So what's going to happen next game, is they're going to come out against the Florida Panthers at 1230 on Saturday. There's your game preview because that's all we're saying. Um, they're going to come out against the Florida Panthers on Saturday at 1230. They're going to lose that game, and the Capitals are going to win, and then you'll be four points back, and the season's over. Like, it's just... You, you're at a state now with every lost game. You can't you, it's or tougher to climb back in or they'll do what they've been doing and, and be just enough into the conversation where you still have to talk about it like they are in the conversation, but they clearly don't deserve to be and they'll win. But the Caps will also win this weekend and it just there will have been no movement that I think yeah. is probably even more likely. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point, too. It's well, the Panthers are really good, but like you get my point. Uh, but they did just lose to the uh, New York Islanders, so uh, Islanders just oh, two points great. back. Yeah, talk uh, about the Islanders again. <laughs> yeah, but the Grand, Rapids, the Grand Rapids Griffins clinched a playoff spot. Yes, good hockey. Se Sebastian Kosa's save percentage is up to like nine fifteen percent. Like, yeah, kind of crazy. He's just like steadily gotten better and better as the season's gone along. Which is what he did last year in Toledo, man. He started off kind of rough and then went on a huge heater and then was fine. I want to personally apologize for, I think, the second year in a row for doubting you, Sebastian. I think in back-to-back -back yeah, -back training you, camps. You love the August overreaction to, like, a rookie camp game. Like, that's, like, your favorite thing in the world. He's, he was 22 years old and he was getting killed by 17-year-olds. Like, 18-year-olds. I was, uh, and after he came off that Toledo year, I was like, was it just a flash in the pan? <laughs> um, but I think it's back to back training camps, right? I dotted him a little bit and then he started off. Okay. But like you said, as the seat, just like with Toledo last year, as the season progressed, he got better and better. And now he's lights out stellar save percentage with the Grand Rapids Griffins. And obviously he's not alone. That entire roster running the same system that alone runs, but they're having success, um, is killing it down there. I mean, Soderblom's finally coming alive. Casper has been playing a lot better. Obviously everyone knows Jonathan Bergeron's like an AHL all-star. He's been fantastic. And even with the loss of Simon Edvinson on the back end, like they're still a very good defensive team. So, I mean, that's going to be really exciting for when the Red Wings ultimately miss the playoffs that I'll have playoff hockey to watch. So. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Scotty, how do you feel about the Detroit Tigers winning their first game of the season? Feel great, man. Feel great. Um, not a pretty win, but 
given how April's have gone the last three years, I don't really care if it's ugly or not. I will gladly take any win in April. You know what, though? I mean, pitching was great. Just some phenomenal. Yeah, the bullpen looked phenomenal, and Tarek Skubal is is an animal. So filthy, filthy. What a yeah, it wasn't even year. like even close to his best stuff either. Like I, I what, and that's what's crazy. Like, was it three hits, no walks, six strikeouts, and six innings? But yeah, he had 20 swings and misses, which he's only done five times in his career in six, and he did it in six innings. And again, not even close to his best stuff, like not even remotely close. Yeah. So yeah, definitely go check out Scotty's stuff at Lockdown Tigers for a little bit of a narrative whiplash. You go from this to winning your Positive season of vibes. <laughs> uh, okay. Any final thoughts, buddy? We ball. We'll be <laughs> you said that with a question mark. <laughs> Uh, we'll be back with a new episode on Monday. <laughs> Can we not? Can we not recap the game against the Panthers? <laughs> Can't wait, where we're at. Rewind the clock a month ago. Oh my God! Same time, same place. To your team. Unfortunately, every day. Every day. <laughs>